Our expert panelists joining us today are Dr. Richard Palmquist, integrative veterinarian and owner of Sentinella Animal Hospital. He's an author, lecturer, and teacher. Dr. Christina Chambro, internationally known homeopathic veterinarian, lecturer, and teacher. Joan Ranquette, animal communicator, teacher, author, lecturer, and owner of Communication with All Life University. And Brendan Golia, professional pet trainer, behavior expert, and owner of OC Canine Coaching. Welcome to Smart Pet Talk. I'm your host, Anna DeVere. In this special episode, we're excited to be joined by Dr. Barbara Royal. Dr. Royal is an esteemed integrative veterinarian, a pioneer in blending conventional and alternative veterinary practices, including nutrition, acupuncture, and herbal remedies for animals. She's the author of The Royal Treatment, A Natural Approach to Wildly Healthy Pets, and featured in the documentary Pet Fooled. Recognized as Oprah Winfrey's preferred veterinarian, Dr. Royal also founded the Royal Treatment Veterinary Centers and co-founded the Royal Animal Health University. She's the former president of the American Holistic Veterinary Medical Association. Welcome, Dr. Royal. It's truly an honor and a privilege to have you joining us. Thank you. Love to be here. Hey, Dr. Palmquist, would you like to open up the conversation today? I would. Any chance I get to talk to Dr. Royal is always a good time for us all. Um, she's Barbara, you, I've known you for a long time, and, and I'm always impressed by how much stuff you do and how you make it all work. I, you know, the, the word doctor, it means one who teaches, and you've been teaching about so many things. I'd just like you to start the show up by uh, talking to us a little bit about your passion to teach, and uh, I'm really intrigued by your concept of this um, ways to health, as opposed to thinking about a doctor as someone you go to when you're broken, maybe doctors should be actually working to help us not be broken. And when we're broken to get better faster. And and so I, I just want you to sort of open the show and talk about that. I think that's a really important thing. Ways to health. Absolutely. That's such a big thing for me. And it's been such an important part of my practice. One of my favorite things in the world is really just sort of rethinking how it is to be a doctor. And so I think one of my methods of of being a doctor has always been like, I might be wrong. You know, it's like, I got to look at this. Is this really, is this really the way to go? Is this the path I should be? Is it about the medicine and treating the disease? Or is it really about finding the causes of health? And I feel like if we provide as doctors, we really should know, like we should provide the causes of health. We should know what the causes of health are for every patient that we see. It's, I mean, it's sort of, you know, the cool thing about being a veterinarian is that we know a lot about a lot of different species. So we should know what it is that brings health to whatever species in front of us. And that typically starts with nutrition. So being able to teach that to people so that they're comfortable dealing with their own pets and so that they're comfortable keeping their own pets healthy so that they don't really need a veterinarian. That's been a huge part of what I do. And I think once we do that and we realize that it's the basics, it's the stuff at home, it's the things my grandmother knew when she ran a farm. I mean, it's do those things right. You know, one of the things you brought up is how each species is different, but also every individual is different. Some dogs thrive on one kind of a diet and others thrive on another kind of diet, whether Mm -hmm. it's the TCM food approach or just simply this one likes does better on cooked and that one does better on raw or the Mm -hmm. people do. Sometimes it's the family, right? Talk Mm -hmm. a little bit about that interaction, how it has everything we do has to work for the family. Yeah. People really think of it in terms of like, you know, okay, well, maybe we just have, you know, we, as a doctor, I could say, okay, this is a dog and all dogs do X, but that's not really true because we have a dog that has lived in my house and done my things and been on my asphalt in front of my house and breathed my things and whatever else has happened to that animal. It's inside the biome, all those bacteria that I've I've grown a population in there, the outside biome on the skin, what kind of oils they've got, what kind of microbes are fighting the good fight for me for that animal. And then what other stresses, what makes them go "Uh," or not? So that affects, you know, the brain affects the gut and the gut affects the brain. And so as we're going through our lives, every animal has different factors that brought them to me in my exam room. 
And for me to pretend that I know everything about that the minute they walk in the door is sort of crazy. Mm -hmm. I should be assessing it. I should be thinking about it. I should be the veterinarian who's who starts to understand the family, starts to understand the animal, is communicating with the owner very directly. I want to be thinking about what they're saying to me. I want to be really tuning into the animal and take my time. I don't want to be, you know, like what's going on right now in medicine. It's sort of turning into this, you know, venture capital, <laughs> corporate veterinary practice everywhere you look. And what that means is we're sort of getting to the point where we're, you know, selling widgets or something like get in, get out, get in, get out. I don't want to do that. I want to be in the family. I want to be able to have time to sit and say, okay, you know, what's going on here? I'm watching you move around the room. We're talking. I'm there and I'm very present for that. And if you're not present for the individual animal, if you're not present to understand the factors that are going in, you're going to miss something really important. And you're going to try to just bulldoze your way through you know, sort of business as usual. And that's not, that's not what an integrative veterinarian should do. I really want to leave it open for others, but I have one question that is important with what you just said. Not everybody has access, who's listening to this, has access to an integrative veterinarian. So yes, it, you're talking about the ideal. We all want that, but it's not available. Mm -hmm. How can people do that themselves along with mm, maybe not, a most, you know, a quick in and out veterinarian. That gets back to us as being, you know, again, if, if we can teach in forums like this, we can teach the owners the causes of health. We can give them the tools that they can just go forth and, and do that. It's actually not as complicated as it seems. And then when you go to the doctor, you're a little more informed and you're not having to go as often and you're thinking about these things. But we can teach the causes of health for the animal in front of you and you can get some basics and then you can see if that works for your animal. And you can try to understand a little bit of that physiology. We've we've sort of divested ourselves of the idea of how to make an animal healthy. It doesn't work. We shouldn't do that. We shouldn't get rid of that the important um, uh, relationship that we all have with each other, with ourselves, with our animals. We should be trying to keep ourselves healthy before we get to a doctor. We're sort of like, oh, an animal's a little bit sick. Go to the doctor. But it really should be first in our hands. And then we need to be dealing with going to a veterinarian or, or, or that kind of thing. And I'm, you know, yeah, I'm a veterinarian. I like, I like when people come in, but <laughs> I don't want it. I want the animals healthy first. It's a, it's a healthier and more fun for me. And that's like what, what Joan said, does. Yeah. yeah. Joan teaches people how to do that. Right, Joan? I do. Well, I teach, um, I teach animal communication and I teach energy healing. So, I mean, it really is about understanding, I mean, taking responsibility for your own animal's health in the same way that we should be taking for ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. And I love, I, I love um, finding the causes of health. So other than nutrition, what would some of the other causes of health be? Well, usually when I start a lecture for vet students, for example, I mean, one of the things, even to your point, Christina, like I'm trying to teach vet students. So this is, this becomes business as usual everywhere. I'm trying to make sure that that happens. But part of the thing when I'm teaching, I usually start with a, with a videotape of a, I took in Costa Rica of a sloth just hanging and reaching really hard to try to chew on a eucalyptus leaf or whatever it's got. And, and the, there's green stuff growing all over its fur and it's got these weird hooky claws and it's cheering and doing all this stuff. And I, and I just sort of say, just imagine if we take this animal as a pet and we bring it down and we make a pureed, you know, eucalyptus leaves and we let them stand on their feet and we wash off all that green stuff, what's going to happen? Like, actually, they're not going to do very well. They need to do all of those things. So whatever that is in the sunshine, in the top of the trees, hanging, having weird stuff growing on them, chewing and really working at something for these muscles, you know, all of that stuff, the causes of health is literally available to us in nature. Just look. Just remember, try to think, what is this particular species of, it's a canine, it's a feline, what do they do really? What have they done historically? And try to put that into your own idea of what an animal should be doing to keep healthy. We shouldn't be bringing all their food to them in a, in a, in, and you know let them just sit on a cushion all day long and do nothing. They're going to lose all their muscle mass. They're going to lose stuff. We shouldn't keep them from you know doing the things that keep their body and soul and their happiness. It's it's the hunt. Sometimes it's 
it's the excitement, it's play, it's movement, it's exercise, it's breathing fresh air. It's a lot of things, right? But it's not that complicated. It seems complicated, but it's like, eh, it's been there for thousands of years. Let's tap into that as doctors. It's the same complex that we're having with ourselves. We're not getting out in the sunshine. Mm -hmm. We're sedentary. We're not eating the right way. Um, you know, we're talking to the computer half the day. But that's mm -hmm. not really communicating with people. That's not social contact. And our dogs don't have cush lives. That's what I hear from a lot of my clients. Well, he's got the cushiest life ever. Look at him. He's got a bed everywhere. He's got a Porsche to lay on. He's got food free sitting on the ground right now, mm -hmm. which isn't food most of the time. But that's, that's the dilemma I have to, I've presented with when I work with my clients as well. It's like, well, we have behavior problems. Or problem, probably they're not problems. They're predictable. They're they're because of the environment is kind of saying so. And what you said was exactly what I wanted to say. I, I approach the same. I, I approach my clients the same way. Very slow, methodical, and I look at the dog. And I, I like what you said about watching and observing. If we don't take a moment to observe what's going on, we will never really know what's really happening. I think people need to look at that more and consider what is around their dog and what enriches their lives. And it sounds like you're saying the same thing. Absolutely. I bet you're very successful with training then. I do pretty good. Because I do feel like a lot of people think of training as sort of the top down, right? I'm just going right. to. Just, be, just behaviors, just commands. not behave. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And that's not the thing. Mm -mm. No. It, yeah, it's be, yeah. connection. It, it's about feeling. It's connection. It's about, it's about the whole, the wellness, like you said. What are these wellness points? What does wellness look like? And I think that's what the re-education for people with their dogs, it's slowly happening, but they're really happy to learn about it when they, when they take the time to sit down with me. Like I didn't really see it that way. And mm -hmm. oftentimes, and this is actually yesterday, I had two German shepherds that were both aggressive, reactive reportedly, and both of them, I didn't have to touch to have them settle and relax. I just had to manage the environment, take my time, reinforce their choice and feelings. And before not, these two dogs were my best friends. Right. And the owners were thrilled. And I'm, I'm thrilled. We got two new clients. We're having some fun and we're going to change their, their relationship. And it had nothing to do with me demanding or changing any behavior on my terms. Right. And I do feel like that's one of the big things. I talk a lot about behavior in the exam room. And I think as a veterinarian too, you know, again, we should be having conversations about health and health involves everything, right? So it, there, there really shouldn't be a place that we can't start the conversation. So for me, I start the conversation with my owners and say, does your pet know who you are? Do they know who you are? Like a lot of times you're like, I'm gonna try and tell them I'm in charge and I'm gonna tell, but do they know who you are? And is that something you've been able to help them understand? And part of that is just interacting with them. I have a lot of people that, oh, I send them off for training two weeks. They, they, they're back and I, they're way better. It's so amazing. And it's like, yeah, that's going to last you a month It'll be, you know, if you're lucky. But they have to know who you are. And that's like in terms of interaction and teaching them, you, you need to teach them new things. In my opinion, an, a, a pet owner, you know, or parent, however you want to call them, should be like a parent, really, you should be teaching them new things, you should be the professor in the room or the mom in the room. You know, like, what did I go to my mom for when I was young, they taught me stuff. And then I yeah, recognize, but, oh, that's my mom. Because she. But then we also, we also have to be willing to learn too, right? I mean, part of being a good parent isn't being king. I, I had a friend who ended up getting divorced because her husband told her that a particular religious text made him king of the castle. And that means she had to do whatever he said. And so we just had a conversation. I said, well, what does a good king do, right? Does a good king tell you everything that you're supposed to do? Or does he find you uh, the terrain and the space to manifest the best of yourself? And she goes, oh, a good king would do that. And I said, yeah, so a, a bad king would sit in the middle of the room and tell you what to do. A good king would go, Oh, I see what you're doing over there. You know, like, how can I help you? How can we use our resources to do that? And so really we're talking about relationship again, as Brendan's saying, and when people become the masters and they don't even know who they are or what they are, that makes the world a very messy place. And when those people are the teachers, then what we learn is that if we do a blood panel with 42 items on them and all of them are in the end, the normal section, then we don't have to worry about that dog. And it doesn't matter because it's normal. And then come back next year and we'll do the test again. And, oh, he's still normal. He's okay. And then all of a sudden he's got kidney disease or he's got other problems. And then we just want to get him back in the middle and then the normal phase. But 
you know, and everyone on the panel knows that a lot of these animals that we have, if we look at them by means of things like Chinese medicine, that, that they're not well, they have an imbalance in their liver meridian, or they have a problem with their skin, which is their kidney and their liver and their lung. And, and so when we start to look at those things and educate people about that and take the mystery out of medicine, then we actually start to find out who we are. And mm -hmm. then we also find out that, you know, it's not about the change that we can bring or the change that we can be. It's, it's literally just being present and being in relationship and then using the resources that we have. And I, you're doing such a good job of that by setting up these mediums where people can go, like the College of Integrated Veterinary Therapy, where veterinarians can go and get trained in nutrition, uh, both Western and Eastern, and discuss what the differences are. You know, there's biochemistry and there's energetics, and there are two very different things. And they mesh in the middle. But if, if you only think you know all about it because you got the degree and you use this company's dog food, you, you, you will be a bad king. Yeah, we've, we've decided to open the College of Integrative Veterinary Therapies, which is civtedu.org, for those of you that don't know, to anyone that's really interested in learning about integrative medicine. And that's because I do feel like this problem isn't just a veterinary problem. It's not just a me problem and it's not just a you problem. It's an us problem. I think globally and, um, you know, for everyone that's had, has animals anywhere in their life, we need to know a little bit better how to reconnect. We need to know about the causes of health. We need to understand that there's more tools. You can find out a diagnosis, you know, as a Chinese practitioner, I can diagnose, you know, some imbalance, but I might use a lot of different therapies in order to get things back again. So being able to learn about that and understand what's out there, it isn't just about a veterinarian has to know that. I do think that, that people in the industry, people who make pet foods, people who are groomers, people who are pet parents, literally there isn't anybody out there that shouldn't know a little bit more about the causes of health. And that's really where I think integrative medicine lands in that we look at the causes of health and then we can talk about all the different amazing modalities that are out there. And if you're feeling like, you know, that kind of thing is a little out of your reach or you're not sure about paying for things, we also have a foundation, the Royal Animal Health University Foundation, where people can donate to help further students and veterinarians and, and research into integrative medicine. So we have a foundation. Um, I know that AHVMA has a foundation. There's lots of different places where you can get information or try to get funding yourself, or if you feel like you do have funding, go ahead and donate to those things. But we're seeing this get to be a bigger place with more help, more options, and I want everybody on that train with us. Um. One of the, I have a couple of things I wanted to bring up. Um, one is going back to what we were talking about with um, looking around and not being the king. I like to call it, um, when I teach, I call it being the emotional leader and really setting the thermostat for harmony so that we can all be different levels, but together we're harmony in the household. And so I, I love what you're saying because it's, it's all the same stuff, just different words. But the other thing I really wanted to bring up is I love what you're talking about with skin because I live with um, four horses and three dogs and three cats. And I think my dogs are probably kind of stinky, but they smell good to me. But I know that most people tend to overbathe and do things. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on, I mean, it's the largest organ. So what you know, how to, how does that get overlooked or what is a way to, for people to consider that as part of, uh, uh, you know, the wellness and the health? Yeah. Um, bathing is such a big issue for me every day because there's so many problems right now. You know, it starts a little bit maybe with food and imbalances and maybe too much sugars and things like that so that we get this sort of yeasty skin. But then we compound it and, it, and it's from a lot of places. A lot of veterinarians believe that that's the way we should do it. We should we should overbathe. We should clean everything off. Like, oh, you're having allergies or you're having a problem. Let's just do a really good detergenty, maybe something that's completely antibacterial, and just you know, sock, you know, just end up just scrubbing everything off. And if you do that kind of a detergenty um, soaping off of all of the oils, all of the bacteria, all the microbes and everything else, 
for a minute, the animal might feel a little bit better if it's got an infection and things are out of balance. Maybe you might get somewhere with that. But if you do that every week, which is often what's recommended, I just get, you know, you can imagine you get sort of this dry skin and skin isn't just skin. Skin, in fact, is a complex combination, certainly in the dog and the cat of, you know, the sebaceous uh, material, the way that the fur interacts with the oils, the bacteria and microbes and all of those things are on there. They're like a coat of armor and they're protecting and they're fighting the good fight. It's a whole army on you or on them. And, and if you detergent all that off, the body has to remake it. And it's like, I got to redo that again. Okay. And so it's trying to do that. But the fact is, as they get older, it's harder and harder. So then I see things like the sebaceous cysts and all those things that happen in those little haired animals that get over groomed at, you know, every four weeks, they're going into the groomer, going into the groomer, trimming and trimming. But you get, they say, oh, these are the types of animals that get these sebaceous cysts and they get these gross and they get all this stuff. I'm like, do they though? Do they? Or is it just something we're making them quickly? I have to make a lot of sebaceous material and I'm empty and oh my gosh, my skin. And so they're trying to do that and they're overdoing it. And all of a sudden it goes, I don't know how to, I can't, my, my sebaceous glands are, are confused. And that's Absolutely. just boring. And yeah. what about ears and plucking hair oh, from ears? Oh, don't touch the ears. <laughs> that's my rule. Don't touch ears. Excellent. You can put things in there like liquids. You can do stuff like that. You can change the pH. You can certainly change the food, but don't go in and poke and push and do that in the ear. Don't do that. Don't so what that. about if we just played in the water, came from the ocean where this, you know, I'm, I'm by the coast and a lot of us go and a lot of dogs get ear infections and I'm sure the, the, the causes are varied. What's in the ear may already be um, susceptible to causing that after the water in there, um, mm -hmm. it's an overgrowth or something, but how do you advise people to, take care of that because i have been to be honest one that uses a specific formula to dry out the ear before and a little bit of antibacterial stuff in there, like colloidal silver even but um is that something you would recommend or do you just kind of just 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 take a cloth yeah no i have a lot I, I live right by the lake i swim every day i go okay. in lake michigan and swim every day year round right so i'm in there my dogs are often with me they're in the water and cold right ice summer hot heavy damp whatever so yeah there's times when i look in there i'm like wow that's just all full of water Mm, that's not so, good. Mm -hmm. so, you know, you do need to, I'll put drops in there. You know, obviously they shake, which yay, do that yourself. But I'll put drops of something in there that can be astringent, that can be, you know, sort of just help them dry out their own right. ear. And I might even do a little bit quickly after they're in, but give it a little time, let them shake for a couple hours and then put something in. But it's not antibacterial. About, yeah. How do you feel about enzymatic cleaners though? Yeah, I mean, some, you know, there's a lot of different things that will work depending a little bit on how they're doing. But yes, it's okay to okay. put something in to help them help them dry it out. Particularly, you got the floppy ear dogs. With yes. Dogs, you know, the, the doodles with so much fur in there. Like, oh, yes. my gosh, let's make sure when you're putting the drops in, it's actually getting in there. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I do see that a lot. And sometimes you do need to pluck the ear hair. Some of them are just bred weird. Like, why would you put so much hair in your ear? So, you know, you we just have to, you know, again, it's the individual. But the idea is yeasts are in there and they make you itchy. Yeast make you itchy. They're the itchiest thing on the skin, right? That's athlete's foot. That's like, uh, itch me. Excellent. They do that on purpose because they're weak little dudes. They can't get into mm. the skin on their own. They're like trying, uh. trying to get in. But you scratch them and rub them and the dog's like, that yeast is itching me. Yes, please do that. Oh, my God. And so but the problem is you've just solved the yeast's problem, not the dog's problem. So the yeast is like, thank you. You just pushed me on into that skin and wax. I'm, I'm here. I'm good. I'm going to have an infection now. So you make your own self, you know, perpetuating problem with that kind of pushing. And when you've made wax go back in there and just don't do it. I'm glad you were talking about bathing and treating the ears. Healthy dogs and healthy cats because they're eating the right food and getting the right exercise and everything you're talking about don't need, they don't make that doggy odor. Yeah, they need a bath if they've gone and rolled in something really smelly and, or they're coming in so muddy. Yeah, they need a bath. But that's a clue. It's what I call an early warning sign of internal imbalance. And that's like doggy odor, cats vomiting hairballs, problem with training. And it's not something you have to fix the symptom, but you want to get in and rebuild the body through, as you talk about, food therapy, microbiome, and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to have you talk a little bit about food therapy because uh, the Chinese food therapy, 
a lot of people are going feed raw meaty bones and they're not individualizing the diet. And Chinese food therapy says a little different than feed raw meaty bones. Yeah, I mean, it's again, it's the individual, right? I start with a basic understanding of every species. So I'm definitely gonna be feeding what I consider is appropriate for the carnivore in the, in the canine, right? So they're carnivores, they are scavengers so they can eat a lot of stuff, but they're really not omnivores that people say they are. What they are is scavengers and able to not die if they eat all kinds of different things, which is great for us because we got a lot of options then, right? So that's lovely. But if you think about it in general, most of the canines that we're treating are really going to do well with a pretty meat centered diet. That's really what I find. I mean, that's 30 years in, I just watch animals eat themselves healthy. That's what I do. So with that in mind, then I move forward. Now, the, the fun part of what I'm doing now is, is the animal diet formulator, right? So we're, I'm looking at that as a tool to balance really well, but then I can use a lot of different ingredients. So if I can use different ingredients to get, you know, to, to the end point of a very balanced diet, that gives me so much of a, a medical option basically in the food. And, and Barbara, that's such a, a gift to people, veterinarians and lay people alike, because you know the way the present operating system is right now, a consumer goes and pays $300 to have a custom diet formulated, which like 25% of the time the dog won't eat. And then that's a one diet that's consistent and never changes. None of us would eat that way. None of us would eat that way. And the people who do eat that way have a real problem with health. So we need to be able to get the biodynamics into the biology, which I think you've accomplished with having that, uh, having that available. So we can both balance the biochemistry and change the sources as we need to based on season and, and malady and energy activity, all those things that, that go into making the diet. So that's huge. Can you talk about that formulator and how people would contact it and be able to use yeah. it? Yeah. yeah, the animal animal diet formulator.com is the uh, is is what we have. We've taken Steve Brown, who is sort of the originator of all of this information. He's he's one of the people that actually corrects USDA data. He's he's been on it. We look at data from you know all over the world. So we're getting it for the the way that we balance here in the US. It's also how it is in Europe. And so we're looking at how everyone in the world gets their data about the ingredients that are in food. And then we put that together and try to figure out, I mean, what's going to be normal for a dog. There's lots of great information or for a cat, right? So we do dogs and cats and probably soon horses. We're going to try to do a lot of different species. But for now, dogs and cats, we know a reasonable amount. I mean, we know and, and can balance foods to some degree. It doesn't have to be perfect every time. Because if you're relying on a, a recipe, just like you said, Rick, if you're relying on a recipe to do everything for you, that's wrong. We need variety. You need to be able to change and have, you know, in this recipe, maybe there's a little more selenium and this one has a little better fatty acid profile. And this, you know, you need different recipes. I never feed the same food to my animals. I and that's, brands. the word is balance, right? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, yeah. if you're eating three meals a day, you're eating a lot of this nutrient in one and only a little of that nutrient, but over the course of the day or over the course of the week, you're getting it in there, you know? Yeah. yeah. So it, 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 and balancing, I, I believe in balanced diets. I believe in making sure that animals have clinically uh, complete balanced diets. But we did a really interesting look at stuff in our practice. And, and this was never published because it's not a, a paper to be published. But we just said, let's make a list of all the miracle cases where people had their eyes pop out and go like, blah, 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 blah. And what we found was really interesting. Not a single one of those was on a diet that's considered complete and balanced by veterinary nutritionists. Now, I am not saying that veterinary nutritionists are wrong. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is we were missing the boat when we say you have to feed this food. You have to feed it the same way every day. And, and it's regardless of any other kind of characteristic. So we, we have to become more dynamic. I just keep using that word when it comes to nutrition. Nutrition isn't fixed. It's not monotonous. It's yeah. It's dynamic. And your life is that way, you know? Yeah. So why would you, why would you expect the same bowl of Cheerios to do your full, I mean, it's just like, if yeah, you, where you went live, to the store, where you, yeah, if you went to the store, yeah, if you went to the store and saw a bag of dry, of, of Cheerios on the shelf and it said complete and balanced for all stages of life, you would go like, 
BS. You would just start laughing. <laughs> you would not feed yeah, that well, to so, your children. So, so right. what we know about nutrition is is actually pretty small. So what I did here, just for your education <laughs> and fun, uh, I made a tray of some things to start with that I start with for for meals, right? So I do have the raw meat and bones because my dogs are now, they are now all paying attention. I've lifted up the bones. Yeah. And <laughs> but I've got my, my husband is, we're, you know, we have an organic farm. My husband's a farmer. We have, um, you know, organic chicken stock that he's makes regularly. We've got eggs from our neighbor. I've got all kinds of different proteins that I'll start with, you know, and I mean, even, you know, organic bacon sometimes for fun, you know, I get lots of different things. And so within that, you know, I've got, and I've got different, different fats. I mean, what is good for a dog? Like all these things, right? So I use butter. They like butter. I put butter inside of a, a used bone like this. My dog's, yeah, she's, <laughs> this is my pearl. She's my pretty bone. excited about this bone. It looks pretty empty, but she's like, no, I really will chew on it. I will chew on this. But if I smear a little butter inside here in the hole, oh my gosh, this is a toy for her. She's really happy. She's solving her own inner problem of, <laughs> uh, of sort of that that mental calm when they're chewing on a bone and they're pretty happy um that's really good for the for you know again for behavior if I, I i couldn't have puppies if i didn't have bones to help them sort of okay do the thing you're meant to do and just chew on that for a while go go be in your crate go be wherever you want to be chew on the bone for a bit so they get meaty bones but then i reuse them for a while so that's around you know, it's, it's a lot of stuff. And it's, I just run through here just so that you have an idea of what I'm talking about. Like I like to put in, so, you know, over here is the, um, all kinds of different oils, right? I'll do different oils. So there's a good fatty acid balance. Then I run everything that I'm thinking about putting in to the dog food through the animal diet formulator. And then it tells me, you know what you need? You need some sardines or you need some, uh, a little bit of ginger to help the magnesium. So I've got ginger and turmeric, or maybe I need to put mushrooms in to get a little better balance for you know some of the micronutrients or I want some more fiber so I'm going to put in some apple peel and some red pepper or I'm going to use blueberries for some antioxidants or broccoli because I've got cancer going on I cook the broccoli it's back here in a little bowl I've got some cooked broccoli and carrots right I can't do this backwards yeah, by the really pepper to right that's really good um, broccoli and carrots or other things that I want to put in even Parmesan cheese, I've got a difficult animal that doesn't like to um, eat. I might sprinkle some good Parmesan cheese from Italy on top of there. I do have a little chocolate on here just to fool you. There's a little tiny blue chocolate behind the sardines. That's not for the dog. That's for me. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's all kinds of different, you know, I'll, I'll be adding in maybe a little coconut or maybe some mushrooms. Um, all these things are, are very them. I do different things. And talking about chewing for cats, I use this for cats to chew. They like that. But it's, it's solved their problem because it's use it or lose it in the animal world. Like you've got to give them things that their body can digest. You don't know what's going on in terms of that day or what's moving through. So, so change it up and, and take care of different parts of the intestine. Take care of the mouth, the jaw, the health of the, the teeth. Do, do what, you know, what causes health. So Barbara, two really, things. Yeah. One is the variety is so important. I have found in my 40 years that we didn't need to use a formulator for most animals, just fed them a wide variety. However, the one thing that we have not talked about at all today, the, there is one thing that everybody agrees that the animals need, and that is either bones or another source of calcium you must balance the phosphorus with some calcium. Okay. So people who feed ground beef, not my recommendation, mm -hmm. or a ground, they need to be feeding some calcium. So that is pretty critical, right? Well, we also have, I have a lot of problems with people now trying to do that, just that thing when they're just saying, we don't need a formulator. I'm not gonna, I don't wanna be that perfect. And nobody really knows anyway. So why should I say that? It's not, nothing's perfect. I'm like, I understand that, but that's wrong. As a veterinarian, I should know better. And I should teach you that you do need not only a bone to balance your calcium and phosphorus, but you need different kinds of fats to balance your fatty acids because the skin on these animals sometimes when they come in on a homemade diet is horrible. Or you also need something to help the thyroid. You'll need to have some um, iodine in there. Where's your source of iodine if you're doing all the foods I've shown you right here? There's no source of iodine in here. There's also not really good fiber, right? So a little bit in some of these vegetables, but I would add other kinds of fiber. I'd be adding kelp for iodine. We have to know how much, how much do they have? At least have an idea and then run with it. 
Mm-hmm. And they're okay. This, they this is really nice. To I actually, do. I'm sorry. I use this actually. I had to use this um, about a year ago. Um, I had some big diet changes, some health issues with one of my pets. And I, I was aware that it's very challenging to find those micronutrients like selenium and iodine. And I, I can't really tell you what's in everything. And the, I went here and I found out I was missing quite a bit. Um, and it, and for the food I wanted to make, I didn't know to add these certain ingredients, like you said. Um, yeah, it's it's it, really it, fun. It, it's actually yeah. like a video game to me because I put all this stuff in and then it goes, oh, you're deficient in this. And if you double click on it, it tells you what's, what food has that in it and how much to add. So Which, something I want to, I have to, I have to ask this question. Nothing we've talked about. And the question you posed before is what are we needing? What is the one thing we have to do? And you mentioned calcium, Christina. I heard nothing about grains from this panel. And I hear a lot of that mm. from veterinarians every week. Can we lay that to rest? Or can we speak about that? That our pets are going to have cardio, cardiac issues if we don't feed them grains? That's already been disproved. And in fact, the FDA has already printed a retraction, but they did it very small. Very so small. It was disproved. And for sure, it was disproved. Nobody ever, ever has said that grains are cardioprotective. There's never been a study that's shown that. There's never anything. So the fact that people are still saying that makes my fur go up, literally, and theirs. Um, it's not true. It was comparing two really bad diets in the study they're, they're looking at where it was two really bad kibble diets. One had grain, one didn't, they thought they saw a little bit of a more, more evidence of a heart disease in the, in the food that didn't have grain. So that's what they decided. Add grains and you'll have better heart condition. Like the, the amount of fallacies in there that just line up behind me, I wrote an article about it and I will tell you, it just like, it was crazy how quickly that just goes. And that's what social media can do for a thing, boil it down to something really easy and and simple to say, it doesn't matter if it's true. Wow, Dr. Royal, I'd like to really thank you for laying out that banquet and this food for thought. And again, the panel, it's great questions. It really hones in. As a pet guardian for me, I really appreciate you talking about the wild animal inside of my cats. I do know that the more I play with them, I'm their teacher, their guardian, but really appreciate the the granular information today. Um, and thanks to our panel for this amazing conversation. Dr. Royal, if, if our audience wants to stay in touch with you, can mm-hmm. you let us know how to do that? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm available through, the, uh, through CIVT, which is again, CIVTEDU.org. So it's a little weird, um, but I'm the CEO and one of the owners of, of the college. Um, also through the Animal Diet Formulator, we have ways to ask questions through that. If you're interested in purchasing that as a pet owner or a professional, um, there's different levels for that. So it's sort of fun. Um, and then also at, at, if you're in Chicago, it's the Royal Animal Health. Um, it's the, the Royal Treatment, sorry. It's the Royal Treatment Veterinary Center in Chicago. Um, and that the Royal Treatment Veterinary Center is in Chicago and in um, outside of Chicago in Wilmette in uh, one of the suburbs. Perfect. And if the audience at home would like to be a part of the conversation, you can email your questions to our website. Thank you again, Dr. Royal, for helping us raise our animal IQ. I hope we'll all remember to practice our pet's love language. And as Christopher Morley says, no one appreciates the very special genius of your conversation the way your dog does. We hope you'll join us again soon. (laughs) Until then, love your pets. Medical information obtained from our website or the live show is not intended to be a substitute for professional care. If your pet has or you suspect they might have an illness or other medical condition, you should consult a healthcare provider. The opinions expressed on this TV program are not necessarily those of Smart Pet Talk, this TV show, or their sponsors. For all questions or info on sponsorship, email us at info at smartpettalk.com or visit our website at smartpettalk.com.